My people of the Mandan Hiradza Rikra came together many years ago. We were gardeners and we lived along the Missouri River. We were created here. The Hiradzas had the creator of Matadz and the Woodza, the first man. Our people were incredibly practical as there was rhyme and reason to everything that they did. My name is Mike Bartholomew. My Indian name is Zesha Igupadirish, Walks with Wolves. And uh, I'm the archivist here. Nawakutaha Skawisahnish. Hello, my name is Jennifer Youngbear. I'm Mandan Hiradza Rikra, and I come from the Fort Berthel Reservation. We created a language immersion school in White Chill, North Dakota. My name is Gerard Baker. My, I'm a Hiradza Mandan, a little bit of Rikara. I worked for the National Park Service for 36 years. My first experience of coming to the National Park was here at these villages. Over there, see that, see that hill right there? Those are the tribal trails, and the tribes coming in to trade here. If you think about where we are historically, um, the Badlands, it's really a highway system. This place affected everybody in miles and miles around us because of the trade systems. The corn that we grew, the, the vegetables that we grew, the berries that we picked, we traded amongst other tribes in the northern plains. There's, there's little villages all over the country here. This is called the Big Head Anza. And the Big Head Aza was surrounded by two different things from a protection standpoint. One of them was the fortification ditch. See it? Goes this way. And it goes around the whole area. Down here. The earth lodges were built by the women. The women owns the home, and the earth lodges are still our homes. And in an earth lodge, all the poles lean on each other, and if one pole gets knocked out, the whole earth lodge will fall. Just like our communities, not just our tribal communities, but our human family community in this whole earth. We all have to take care of one another. We all have to do our part just like that earth lodge. We all have to lean up on each other and help and do our job that we're supposed to do to take care of this earth and to take care of life. It's a centralized place, it's a communal place, it's where families come together, it's where they share in stories, share in song, share in traditions and their histories. And even though the structure itself changes, even though the Earth Lodge changes, you know, that family unit is still retained, there's still uh, multi-generational households, there's still elders within the home, there's still a transference of knowledge from elders to, to little ones. I think that's why Carl Bodmer like included it, you know, that interior of that Mandan Lodge. And that's like what it speaks to. It's our vantage point into the past. It's our way to like look back and to learn something about ourselves. There's so much in that imagery. And you know, whether you're looking at like the interior of a Mandan Earth Lodge, or you look at, you know, the material culture of people like Beirut's Karuba, two ravens, and you see there like in the material culture what he's wearing signifies his affiliation with the age grade society, his own personal deeds, his own personal feats. I have paintings of Bodmer in my home. Do you remember when you look at your grandpa, forebears on the wall, that you come from great warriors and that you must follow in the footsteps of your ancestors? This was their apex because it was years after the 1781 smallpox. By the time uh, Bodmer came around, we had kind of climbed out of that and we, and we were at our apex of our ceremonies again. We were apex of who we were again as human beings, as, as tribes again. There's this question and it's, you know, who are we? Where do we come from? And it's not a new question. It's something that even Wadzeda Nuwadzish, the lone man, he asked himself. They say that in that old creation narrative, you know. It's something every single generation has asked. You know, who are we as Hiradza? Who are we as Mandan? Who are we as Sanish? We're a people of survivance, and then also, you know, we retained a lot of our traditions despite everything else. Oh, what's it What's it It looks like nothing. I mean, this looks like the little dips in the in the ground right now. But this was a village, and if you if you look at the pictures of Bodmer and the other the other early um, artists, for example, like George Catlin, some of those guys. What we're missing in those pictures, what we're missing in those paintings, is life. You know, when I used to work here a long time ago, that's before all this stuff was built up. 
And so I would go to this place, and I would go to where I thought the door was. Because you can always look at these, and you can always, almost see where the door is. And even today, I can't walk in these places. Even today, I have a tough time walking across. I can't walk across these lodges. It's still somebody's home. I used to come out here, and, and I would bring, for example, Bodmer and, and, his, and his writings and works. And I would go to these lodges. And it's like the old days. You can't just walk into somebody's house. Sometimes they have um, um, uh, deer hooves, and you like a doorbell, you shake it. I always try to go back to this place when, when it was alive, when there was thousands of people here, when there was dogs howling, when there was people singing, when there was, there was kids playing. I tried to even, even taste the air, if you will, because there'd be people cooking. Maybe people cooking all kinds of good stuff from the gardens, or maybe, maybe even ichi from the from the buffalo, which is tripe, which is first-class T-bone steak, as far as I'm concerned. I could almost feel myself going back in time. I start, I start imagining people start standing up and start working, and I got to a point where it was just a veil, I thought, and all I had to do was take one more step, and I chickened out. It was right over here. I chickened out. And because I thought to myself, if I, if I take that step, there's no way I want to come back. We've dealt with this really, at times, frustrating history where we've had to contend with um, all of these outside factors that have tried to transform us into something else. You know, these people went from, from, from here, smallpox, to, to, to everything else, to the flu epidemic and everything else. And then at the same time, they had a complete change of life when it came to the government. We survived a Holocaust. We survived um, 500 years of assimilation with boarding schools, relocation. It was um, against the law to practice our religious beliefs and our ceremonial way of life. It was even outlawed to dance at powwows. They lost so many people there that they really questioned, you know, what makes us Mandan? Are we still Mandan? Are we still Hiraj? Are we still Saanish? What does that mean? And what does it mean in this like new, new time, in this modern time? We can go into the future and we can, we can create these seeds of life and we can create a better way for our future with the same principles, with the same honor and respect as our ancestors. The outside larger culture is always trying to determine what's authentic for us. And it's like, oh no, you guys need to be stuck in the 19th century. You should all look like you just walked out of an Edward Curtis photograph, you know? But we're not like that. We're evolutionary, we're adaptable. This structure here, the MHA Interpretive Center, is supposed to be a cultural hub. This is supposed to be, you know, a learning center, a place for us to reorient the narrative and to tell our stories from our perspective and what happened to us here. Very rarely have we been afforded the opportunity to tell our own histories, to share our own narratives. And we understand like our own place like differently than outsiders would. You know, we should be the ones telling the story here. Anthropologists tell a story from a black and white situation. Okay? Science and science, black and white. When we come in, we add life to them. We add a story. To the, to, the, to the science core. People say that the Mandan people are gone. No, we're not. We still sing our songs. We still practice our ways. The women still build earth lodges. We still take care of them, and it's a lot of work. What really makes us Nakhbagas, what really makes us Indian people, is the way that we act, the way that we interact with each other. Were you welcoming? Were you good to people? Did you shake their hand? Did you acknowledge them? When they came to your house, did you visit them from the porch? No, you invited them in, you gave them something to eat. Luckily, we have enough educated people within the, within the government now that are coming from reservations or coming from minority backgrounds that understand that. And so they're opening those doors a little bit. And all this work we've done throughout the years on uh, cultural history, on bringing the cultures into our government buildings, if you will, is starting to pay off finally. It's starting to pay off. I was one of the first generations out of many people that, that we could dance again, we could pray again, we could celebrate again, and there was so much to celebrate because we had experienced so much hardship for so many years. 
Well, when we're dancing out there, we're, we're, it's a healing for us. The drum is a healing for us. The celebration, the happiness. When you're clear in your mind, when you're clear in your spirit, you don't have anything to be scared of. There's nothing to be scared of. There's only to, to celebrate and to give thanks for life.